Hey guys, Sean here. Welcome to the F1 Word and to a roundup of some of the news stories from the world of Formula One over the last few days. And we have had a few interesting developments. Starting us off then, and Christian Horner has expressed his displeasure at the proposals put forward to improve the racing in Formula One from next season. As I mentioned in last Saturday's news roundup, changes to aerodynamics in a bid to improve overtaking in 2019 were voted through last week. And although that went down well with fans, it did not go down well with the majority of the teams. And during an interview with Sky Sports F1 shortly after FP1 today, the Red Bull boss slammed those changes. He stated, Sometimes this sport has the ability to shoot itself in the foot. What has been done for 2021 is all good stuff. The problem is a snapshot of what has been taken. It hasn't been fully analysed. There's no proven conclusion from it. It's been rushed into a set of regulations. It completely conflicts existing regulations. Now they are scrapping around, trying to tidy that up over this weekend. If you saw the interview, I'm sure you'll agree his frustrations were pretty clear to see. And he went on to address the added cost that the changes will inevitably run to. It completely changes the philosophy of the car. The front wing will be wider. The point that the air meets the car is the front wing. That then changes everything behind it. So suspension, bodywork, absolutely every single component. And we talk about costs and responsibility. What's just been introduced is a completely new concept. It will cost millions and millions of pounds. The changes were rushed after Melbourne because it was a race with not a lot of overtaking. When has there ever been any overtaking in Melbourne? And we've had three great races since then. I just find it frustrating that decisions are made on zero evidence, zero conclusions on theories, and the burden of costs is passed to the team. So he and Red Bull are not very happy with the changes and from all reports, it sounds as though the majority of the paddock feel the same way. Christian Horner was also asked, by the way, about the team's 2019 engine decision and also whether the May deadline, either the 15th of May or the 31st of May, were correct. But the Red Bull boss insisted that they would not be making any decision before June. Sticking with those proposed 2019 changes for a moment, and although Formula One are hoping that it will improve the racing, they have confirmed that the cars could be up to 1.5 seconds a lap slower than they are this year. Nicholas Tombassis stated, We expect this rule change to be approximately one third of the way less performance of the delta between 2016 and 2017. So we expect to lose 1.5 seconds maybe, that sort of order. It's a bit difficult to predict exactly the amount of development the teams will put on, but we certainly expect to lose performance of that order of magnitude. He also went on to say that he felt the proposals would make the racing better. I think the probability that we make it better is very good. The probability that we make it better, but not by a huge amount, is also there. I think the probability that it actually makes things worse is close to zero, if not zero, in my view. Now hopefully the changes put forward will make a difference to the racing next season. What we as fans want is close racing and plenty of overtaking opportunities. It sounds so obvious when you put it like that. But whether or not these changes will make any difference obviously remains to be seen. It's all been about future rule changes this week in Formula 1 and bosses are looking to axe grid penalties from 2021 onwards unless, of course, they are absolutely warranted. The penalties are heavily criticised by many in the F1 paddock and fans alike. And they have definitely come under fire more recently following the 2018 three-engine-a-year rule. And of course, as I'm sure you'll remember, frustrations were also very high following last season's Italian Grand Prix weekend. Charlie Whiting stated, We would like to get rid of all grid penalties if we could. That's what we are working towards. On top of the engine penalties, gearboxes also account for a high number of grid penalties being imposed. And interestingly enough, F1 bosses are looking to make changes in that area as well. Charlie Whiting feels that the current rules around gearboxes are, and I'll quote, a good system. So changes in the short term are unlikely, but Whiting went on to say, if we change to anything, it will be a pool of gearboxes, like we have a pool of engines. So you are only allowed three gearboxes for the year and do what you like with them, but that's all you will have. It is one of the things we are thinking for 2021. We are introducing a fairly comprehensive package with a number of changes. So as well as the technical changes for 2021, it looks as though F1 is set for its biggest overhaul in many years. As well as the changes to grid penalties and possibly the gearbox system, another thing that looks set to get the axe in 2021 is DRS. However, as of right now, the drag reduction system is seen as a necessary evil. The sports technical chief, Nicholas Tom Bassis, said, It is right that there's this underlying discomfort with DRS, and I share it as well. I know Ross has made similar comments. 
we feel that DRS is the right thing to have in the present state of things. For 2021, we hope that the cars will be much more able to follow each other closely and it will be a really nice outcome if we can severely decrease DRS in the future or even eliminate it. But until we get in a position where we are comfortable enough with the wake performance and how cars can follow each other, I think it's something that I would perhaps call a necessary evil at the moment. However, ironically, despite the recent comments, DRS is set to become more powerful in 2019, to which he added, the DRS effect will increase by approximately 25 to 30%. The delta of the drag of the car when it opens a DRS and deploys it to current will be bigger. So the delta of the speed of the following car will be bigger by that amount as a result. Hence the probability that approaching the front car will increase. As everyone who follows the channel probably knows by now, I am not a fan of DRS and getting rid of it would go down very well with me. However, I will just echo what has been said by Formula One there, that the cars need to be able to follow more closely and overtake before we lose the system. The proposed Miami Grand Prix has overcome its first hurdle after receiving preliminary approval from the Miami Commission. The vote, which was unanimous, will now allow Formula One bosses to move on to the next stage of the planning with a view to introduce the race for 2019. Liberty Media's Sean Bratches said, We recognise that this is only the start of the process and we will immediately get to work with the various community stakeholders, the City of Miami, the Port of Miami, Bayfront Park Management Trust and others in order to reach a final agreement. Formula One in Miami represents a fantastic opportunity to bring the greatest racing spectacle on the planet to one of the world's most iconic cities and we are delighted that the journey is underway. The first look at the possible track layout received criticism from many, including us to be fair, over the last week. So let's hope that if the race is going to go ahead, there are changes before anything is finalised. And finally, practice one and two took place in Barcelona earlier today and as well as the on-track action, the focus was also very much in the garages as teams unveiled their new updates. The most visible changes came at Ferrari, Red Bull and McLaren, with the latter introducing a very different looking and a very aggressive looking nose, which to be honest looks a little bit like a mix of the Sauber Mercedes and Force India noses. Ferrari have been the first team to take advantage of the FIA's clarification on halo mountings which came earlier in the season and have therefore mounted their mirrors to the device with some winglets also included, although there is talk that they may not be legal, so watch this space. As for Red Bull, they have also taken a comprehensive set of upgrades as they aim to close the gap to Ferrari and McLaren. But before I go, let's have a very quick look at the final standings from FP1 and FP2. Starting, obviously, with FP1, it was Valtteri Bottas who topped the session eight tenths of a second clear of his teammate Lewis Hamilton. Mercedes definitely look on the pace this weekend. Vettel was just a tenth further back on Hamilton, Verstappen fourth, Raikkonen in fifth place. Good showing in terms of pace from McLaren. Some are talking about the possibility that they might be sandbagging. I'm not 100%, but I guess we'll find out tomorrow in qualifying. Ricardo 7th, he binned it, actually put it in the wall at turn 4. And that ended his session very early. Grosjean, good showing in 8th, with Van Dorn ninth and Pierre Gasly rounding out the top 10. Kevin Magnussen, P11, good showing from Sauber Leclerc in 12th and Ericsson in 14th. Perez in 13th. Sainz, Ocon and Hulkenberg follow that with Hartley in 18th. And a miserable morning. Great to see Robert Kubica back on track, but just no pace in that Williams by the look of it. 19th and 20th. Probably the biggest feature, if you like, of FP1 was the fact the cars were really struggling to stay on track. It is a new surface, of course. The same one from winter testing, but obviously different conditions now. But yeah, the drivers really having to fight for their lap time around here. It's great to see. Don't often see that in Spain. It continued to some extent into FP2 where Lewis Hamilton topped the session, but just over a tenth ahead of Daniel Ricciardo in the Red Bull, whose teammate Max Verstappen is right behind him. Red Bull looking good this weekend. Great showing from Haas, seventh and eighth for them. Not too bad on pace at all. McLaren not a million miles away either, and Sergio Perez there, tenth place for him. One quick talking point from that top ten, though. Kimi Raikkonen retired with what looked like a power unit issue. Puff of smoke was told to stop the car, and he rolled it back to the garage. Worrying signs there, of course, for Ferrari. Esteban Ocon, P11. Again, good showing in FP2 from Force Indy. They weren't really on it in FP1, but it looks like they're on for a good weekend. Fernando Alonso, P12. Doesn't look great, but the lap time is definitely there. That is what, just a few hundredths outside the top 10, so it's definitely close in the midfield. Nico Hulkenberg, 13th. Gasly, 14th. Ericsson and Leclerc keeping their good pace up for Sauber. Carlos Sainz down in 17th on home turf. Pretty sure he's got more to give though. Brendan Hartley in P18 and again Williams 
Really worried for them now. Updates on the car, still absolutely nowhere. Stroll 19th and Sorokin in 20th. Of course, as I've already said, they are just the practice times as FP3 tomorrow, but it's qualifying when we're really going to know what these guys have got. That is it though from me today. I will be back tomorrow with the qualifying report. And don't forget to join us live this Sunday around about an hour and a half after the race finishes for the race debrief. In the meantime, though, you can follow me on social media, links to Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and to Discord, all in the description down below. But as ever, thank you for watching. I've been Sean. This has been the F1 Word. And until next time, goodbye.